Welcome back everyone to another installment of Space This Week, the Monday series in which I give you a recap of the past seven days of Starship development, launch events and all the other stuff that I think is worthy of mention. And we have a big one today, the longest ever static fire from Super Heavy Booster 7, two Soyuz missions, a crewed launch to the Chinese space station and much, much more. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the world's greatest website creator. More on them later, but first, let's talk about Starship development. Let's not dilly-dally with any small stuff. You all know that the biggest event we saw last week with Starship news was the massive 11-engine Raptor 2 static fire test. Of course, many people have raised the question about why fewer engines were used in this static fire test. A couple of weeks ago, we saw Booster 7 fire 14 engines. So why is it only 11 now? Well, this test was in service of a slightly different goal. For starters, this was a long duration static fire, so the actual length of time of the burn was longer. Also, the launch pad has just had its concrete replaced with a more blast resilient formula, so a long duration static fire is a good first test to see how well it holds up. A literal trial by fire, I guess. <laughs> the main objective of this test, however, was to test the autogenous pressurization system of Booster 7, which is why the liquid oxygen tank was fully filled. You can tell by the way the frost extends to the full height of the oxygen tank. Autogenous pressurization is a means of keeping a rocket's fuel tanks pressurized. Usually, this is achieved with a high pressure gas. Falcon 9, for example, uses helium to maintain pressure in its tanks. Autogenous pressurization is when a small amount of the rocket's fuel is evaporated by the engines and then fed up back into the fuel tank to maintain pressure since gas is less dense than liquid. This is advantageous for Starship because the fuel used is methane and oxygen, which are both resources that can be easily refined on Mars. Not many vehicles have successfully used autogenous pressurization in the past. The most famous vehicle to use it operationally is the Space Shuttle, though another example of a vehicle that used it is the Titan 34D. So yes, bit of a tangent there, but that was what Tuesday's test was all about. I gotta give a massive plug for Cosmic Perspective once again. Check out this amazing slow motion video of the test. Link to the full resolution 4K video in the description and make sure you crank the volume up as well. On Thursday night, workers were seen removing one of Booster 7's Raptor 2 engines, and then later on were seen installing a new replacement engine. Later on, a second engine was removed from the vehicle and taken away, and then, just visible through the fog, we saw a replacement unit placed onto the work stand and then installed on the booster. So, how did Stage 0 hold up? Well, visually, the orbital launch mount looks okay. A little scorched, but that's going to be an inevitability. <laughs> One question on many people's minds is why aren't SpaceX making use of a flame trench? If you look at a Soyuz launch, you can see that the launch pad has a gigantic cavern underneath it to divert flames away from the launch infrastructure. And NASA uses them as well at the Kennedy Space Center. Heck, even the Kerbals figured this out. <laughs> well, the big issue with Boca Chica's Stage 0 is that the launch pad is at ground level. Don't know if you've looked where Starbase is, but digging below ground level puts you below the water table, which means that any flame trenches would need to be constantly pumped free of water. The Kennedy Space Center is also pretty much at sea level, and this is why the launch pads there are so built up. You can see how high the launch pads are compared to the surrounding land. They're built raised up like that so that the flame trenches can be above the water table. So it's not really feasible to dig a trench under stage zero right now. It would need to be torn down and raised up a few meters higher. Hopefully no significant damage occurred in the wake of last week's static fire. I'd just like to draw your attention to this photo here. Now if you look just here, you can see Squarespace, who have sponsored today's video. Guys, if you've been living under a rock and don't know what Squarespace is yet, then strap in, buckaroo. <laughs> Squarespace is the internet's number one website builder. And hey, if you have been living under a rock, then why not start a blog site using Squarespace to tell the world about your subterranean life? I'd read that. Just head on over to Squarespace, hit start, tell it what sort of websites you want to build, and then take a scroll through the huge number of high quality and professionally designed templates until you find a design you like, and then crack on! You can customize everything about the template, from the images, the background, the font, and the text, to transform it into your very own personal creation. And it's not just blog sites you can make. If you're a business owner, maker of things, wanting to set up an online store, or anyone else trying to make a name for themselves in this modern world, then you need a website. And why not make one with Squarespace? It's free to create your site, no credit card info required up front, and then once you're ready to launch, you can save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain by heading over to squarespace.com slash 
Go on, do it now and begin your online journey today. Last week's Starship activities concluded with the removal of Booster 7 from the launch pad on Friday. This would allow SpaceX to install the aero covers on the outer Raptor 2 engines. You can see that the plumbing is still a little bit exposed there. And this will also allow SpaceX workers to work on the orbital launch pad if any work or upgrades still need to be done. The biggest launch event of the past week was the launch of a Long March 2F on the 29th of November. This was the Shenzhou 15 mission, the fourth crewed flight to the Chinese Tiangong space station, and a big first for China. Until now, the Tiangong has only ever had three Taikonauts on board, with one crew leaving before the next crew arrives. This time, however, the Shenzhou 14 Taikonauts were still aboard, making this the first Chinese crew handover in space. After docking to the front port of the Tianhe core module, the Shenzhou 15 hatch was opened on the 29th of November, and we saw some nice footage of the Shenzhou 14 Taikonauts welcoming their successors on board. This is the first time there's been an overlap of two Shenzhou missions, which means that this is the first mission in which the space station remains permanently inhabited. And the reason the station can support double the crew now is because of the recent addition of the Mengtian laboratory module, which brought the station up to its final size. Over the course of their 180 day mission, the crew of the Shenzhou 15 will carry out three to four spacewalks, work on payloads both inside and outside the space station, and conduct other scientific work. The Shenzhou 14 crew departed shortly after on the 4th of December, where they went on to re-enter the atmosphere and land in Inner Mongolia, having spent a grand total of 182 days, 9 hours and 25 minutes in space. On the 28th of November, the Orion spacecraft reached its maximum distance from Earth, 432,210 kilometers to be precise. For Americans watching, this is the length of approximately 237.5 million Joe Bidens. That's a lot of Joes. From the external views, it's pretty cool to see the moon and Earth looking similar in size. Perspective is a crazy thing. This is the furthest from Earth a spacecraft built for humans has ever flown, but it's on the way back now. On the 1st of December, the engines of the Orion's European service module fired up, dropping its perigee to facilitate a high-speed powered flyby close to the moon's surface in order to put it on a trajectory back towards Earth. Last week, we saw two Soyuz launches from the Russian Plesetska launch site. Shown here in some completely politically neutral footage, on the 28th of November, a Soyuz 2.1b launched a GLONASS-M satellite to medium Earth orbit. GLONASS is the Russian radio-based satellite navigation system comparable to the American GPS system, and this particular satellite, designated Cosmos 2564, is the final GLONASS-M satellite to be launched. The other Soyuz launch that we saw last week took place on the 30th of November. This was another Soyuz 2.1b, this time carrying a classified signals intelligence satellite for the Russian Ministry of Defense. Last week, I covered how NASA has begun releasing more footage from the Artemis 1 launch, giving us some views from the cameras mounted to the side of the rocket during the launch. And last week, we got one of the coolest shots yet. Here is the moment from inside the Orion capsule when the launch escape system and its fairing jettisoned, revealing the blackness of space to the capsule's window. Windows. Imagine actually sitting in those seats and seeing this in real life. That's going to be a reality for the lucky crew of Artemis 2. What an amazing sight to see. Lown Aerospace released some new merchandise last week. Yes, if you want to buy a Deep Space Kraken Slayer shirt, sweater or hoodie, then you will instantly gain plus three glitch resistance when playing Kerbal Space Program. And I'm told by the dev team that this effect should carry over to Kerbal Space Program 2 when it releases. So it's definitely a worthwhile investment. There's a link to my merch store in the description below. But I would now like to give a massive thank you to the list of names scrolling on screen. They're my amazing channel members and patrons, and it's their generous support that allows me to keep on making these videos for you all. If you want to see your name there, then head on over to either program using the links below. And hey, if either of the videos on screen look interesting to you, then be sure to check them out. I've had some really great feedback on my latest Kerbal Space Program video, so I hope you guys enjoy that if you've not seen it already. And that's it. Goodbye.